Good afternoon. It's an honor to welcome you to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation Institute. As Chief Education Programming Officer, I always stand in awe of this place when I stand and look out at the house that Reagan built. You know, this is a sole nonprofit organization created by President Reagan charged with advancing his legacy and core principles. Individual liberty, economic opportunity, freedom and democracy, peace through strength, and national pride. As a native Illinoisan, I've always admired Pepperdine, our partner today from afar. Over the last few weeks, I've learned some more about the institution and how our organizations share common goals and values. We strive to be mission-driven. We always are committed to the highest excellence of standards and we are dedicated to serving others. We'll learn more about that today. As Reagan said once, we can't help everybody, but everyone can help someone. And service to others is our, in our shared DNA, Pepperdine and the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. When I was asked to introduce Dean Peterson today, I thought about how to best do that. We've sat and had a meal together once, and I reflected on, should I recite his CV, all of his amazing experiences? But I thought differently. I thought maybe I would introduce him by saying the three things that I have come to know about him in my limited time meeting with him. First, Pete serves others through his leadership at the School of Public Policy. He strives to make communities better through public service and servant leadership. Second, I know Pete's a man of deep faith. We share this over a meal. God has a plan for Pete that makes use of his skills daily to better the world. And finally, Pete's somebody who is always push you in your thinking. That's what I like most about him. He strives to make you better in the name of improving yourself and others. It's a distinct honor to welcome the Pepperdine School of Public Policy and my dear friend Pete Peterson to the stage. Thank you so much, Richard, for that amazing introduction. I hope we captured that on video so I can show it to my daughter when we get home. <clears throat> she has a slightly different opinion of me, so I, I appreciate that. It is great to be back in the house that Reagan built. As you said, Richard, uh, our last event here from the School of Public Policy was just last year, our 25th anniversary celebration, which we celebrated under the wings of Air Force One last February. The theme for that night was Let Freedom Ring. And in many ways, the theme for today is the same, but focused. Let freedom ring and let it ring in American higher education. Freedom is what grounds both of our institutions, the School of Public Policy and the Reagan Foundation and Institute. While Pepperdine's relationship with President Reagan goes back over half a century, more than the personal ties between him and many of Pepperdine's founders and supporters, the foundational commitment to freedom, its direction toward human flourishing, and the fight against the forces of a liberalism is what truly connects us. Reagan understood that in a free society, it required free institutions inculcating the virtues necessary to take on the remarkable responsibilities of American citizenship. From the family, to the church, to the classroom, Reagan often spoke of the vital importance each of these institutions must play in preparing citizens. Then Governor Reagan's clashes with Cal, the Cal Berkeley administration in the 1960s are the stuff of legend. But at the heart of these conflicts was the through line of his entire career in public life. This commitment to freedom and the institutions tasked with guarding it. These last few years have been challenging ones in American higher education if we're to evaluate it on the scales of freedom. 
I would argue that the COVID crisis was the first step in making many parents aware of what was being taught in their children's classrooms. But it's been the events on college campuses since the Hamas attacks on Israel on October 7th that have revealed even more about the ideological climate at many colleges and universities. In the current issue of The Atlantic, an article appears titled The War at Stanford. It's actually written by a Stanford sophomore and describes the campus climate there since the attacks of October 7th. He writes this in the current issue, quote, in a remarkably short period of time, aggression and abuse have become commonplace and accepted part of climate and campus activism. People tend to blame the campus wars on two villains, dithering administrators and radical student activists. To my mind, it's the average students who have changed. He, he goes on. I've encountered a persistent anti-intellectual streak here at Stanford. I've watched many of my classmates treat death so cavalierly that they can protest as a pregame to a party. As a friend emailed me not long ago saying, quote, a place that was supposed to be a sanctuary from such unreason has become a factory for it, unquote. To help us understand the scope and scale of the challenges we are facing in American higher education, but also to show us how we can be hopeful that freedom can return to American higher education, I can think of no one better than our Reagan honorary professor, Robbie George, to speak with us today. Robbie is the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and the director of the James Madison Program at Princeton University. Grounding his own remarkable career is the similar commitment to freedom and through it the pursuit of truth. Please join me in welcoming today's speaker, Dr. Robbie George. Well, uh, thanks to all of you uh, for uh, coming out and, and what an honor uh, it is to be in the house uh, that the Gipper built. Uh, I want to uh, thank the wonderful leadership uh, of the uh, library. Uh, Richard, David, what a pleasure to be here under your leadership. And of course, uh, it's a great joy to be with my beloved friends, President Jim Gash and Dean Pete Peterson of Pepperdine. They are truly doing uh, the Lord's work at that wonderful institution. I'm very proud of my uh, affiliation uh, with Pepperdine University as an honorary uh, professor. And I have enormous regard, of course, uh, for President Reagan and the memory of President uh, Reagan. What a great and inspiring leader uh, he was. Uh, I've always been inspired by his motto. You will recall Reagan's famous motto. He took it from an old Russian proverb. Uh, he would quote it in Russian and then translate it into English. Trust but verify. And uh, that uh, inspired me to adopt my own uh, motto, um, which has served me very well uh, in 39 years uh, in academic politics. And it was really, as I say, inspired by Reagan's motto. My motto uh, in academic politics is forgive but retaliate. Um, and that really has served me well. <laughs> Liberal arts colleges and universities have three fundamental purposes. The pursuit of knowledge, the preservation of knowledge, and the transmission of knowledge. That's it. Now, of course, there are other desirable ends that such institutions legitimately seek while also pursuing these purposes, but these three are fundamental, constitutive, defining purposes. These are why you have liberal arts colleges and universities. The other things liberal arts institutions legitimately do are founded on these things, and anything they do that undermines these fundamental and constitutive purposes, they should not be doing. So, for example, though I support college athletics, I support them only insofar as they do not damage the academic program, the transmission of knowledge. And all too often, as we all know, academic programs have been put in an inferior position with respect to athletic programs at some of our universities when or to the extent that any extracurricular activity 
harms the academic program, that activity needs to be reformed, or if reform isn't feasible, abolished. Now, there are, as I say, certain colleges and universities today, as in the past, that place too heavy an emphasis on, for example, athletics at the expense of the academic program. But for most institutions, a far graver threat is posed by the politicization of the academy. The problem is most vividly manifest in the phenomenon I call campus illiberalism. By that I mean the unwillingness of so many members of college and university communities to entertain or even to listen to arguments that challenge the opinions that they happen to hold. At some colleges and universities, speaking invitations to dissenters from campus orthodoxies are simply not issued. Or if they are issued, dissenting speakers are disinvited under pressure from opponents of their views. Or if they are not disinvited, they are pressured to withdraw under the threat of disruptive forms of protest. This happened a few years ago to the great professor, former Secretary of State, now Hoover Institution Director at Stanford, Condoleezza Rice, who was pressured to uh, abandon uh, the talk that she was supposed to give, a graduation address, commencement address at Rutgers University in my home state under the threat of disruptive protest. Or if they do not withdraw, they are interrupted by abusive protesters, shouted down, or even, you'll recall this case from Middlebury College just a few years ago, assaulted. This is often done in the name of deplatforming, that is, denying a platform for the expression of views that are or are deemed to be, by those in the majority, in power, obnoxious or hurtful or bigoted or harmful or otherwise unworthy of being expressed and heard. And it is not just visitors to campuses. Faculty and student dissenters within campus communities have sometimes been subjected to abuse and intimidation. Every effort is made to ensure that they are denied opportunities to speak or are intimidated into silence. Now the core of the problem, it seems to me, is this. Many institutions are letting the side down when it comes to the transmission of knowledge, the teaching mission, by failing to ensure that our students at every level are confronted with and have the opportunity to engage, to consider the best that has been thought and said on competing sides of questions on which Americans, reasonable people of goodwill, disagree. They are permitting prevailing opinions on campus to harden into dogmas, dogmas that go unchallenged, leading students to accept the false belief that there are, in fact, no disputes among reasonable people of goodwill on this or that question. So at the core of our problem is the toxic thing that provides an environment in which illiberalism flourishes and can be expected to manifest itself in the ways it manifests itself today, the shouting down and the assaults and so forth, namely the phenomenon of groupthink. Now, the problem I'm calling attention to here is less about unfairness to minority perspectives, such as the perspectives of conservatives or libertarians at many institutions. That's a bad thing. That needs to be redressed. That needs to be fixed. But it's not fundamentally what I'm calling attention to here. It's more about the need to avoid and where it has set in overcome groupthink in order to fulfill a constitutive purpose of academic institutions. That is the pursuit of knowledge. We owe that to our students and we owe it to them whether they like it or not. It is a scandal when students are graduated from liberal arts colleges and universities, among them the most esteemed, the most eminent in our country, the most prestigious, with no understanding, or worse yet, grotesque misunderstandings of the arguments advanced by serious people who hold beliefs that differ significantly from their own. 
for reasons brilliantly articulated by the great 19th century English liberal philosopher John Stuart Mill in his essay on liberty, even if the opinions the students happen to have acquired uh, in groupthink uh, happen to be true, students' ignorance of the arguments of dissenters will prevent them from understanding the truth as deeply as they should and actually appropriating it. That is to say, understanding why it is so and why competing views have nevertheless attracted the attention and even the allegiance of reasonable people of goodwill. And if that's true, which it is, then it can only be even worse when students find themselves stuck in false beliefs because they have not allowed those beliefs to be challenged. The great early 20th century jurist, Learned Hand, who was the greatest judge never to make it to the Supreme Court of the United States, famously said that, and I quote, the spirit of liberty is the spirit of being not too sure you are right. In making that point, Judge Hand was not endorsing radical skepticism or moral subjectivism or relativism or anything of the sort. He was not saying there is no truth. On the contrary, he was articulating a condition of truth seeking that is the recognition of our own fallibility, the possibility that we might be wrong or at least partially wrong. And therefore we need to listen to what a critic has to say so that if in fact we're wrong or partially wrong, we can move from error in the direction of truth. But what he says about the spirit of liberty is also true of the spirit of truth seeking. A sense of one's own fallibility, a sense that one could be wrong, even in one's most basic premises and fundamental beliefs, an openness of mind, a willingness to entertain criticism and to engage critics. All of these things are essential to the truth seeking project, the very mission of liberal arts colleges and universities. And that means that they must be cultivated in such institutions. Now, that is not to say that we should not be advocates of our points of view or that scholars should not be engaged politically. But politically engaged scholars, like all scholars, need to be highly cognizant of our own fallibility even on matters about which we care deeply, and even when it comes to issues that are profoundly important to us, issues in which we're deeply emotionally invested. Even as advocates, we must cultivate intellectual humility and a willingness to entertain the other guy's arguments in a serious way. One must never imagine, it's entirely contrary to the spirit of learning, if one ever imagines that his convictions have to be right, couldn't possibly be wrong, the convictions of his adversaries are obviously wrong, couldn't possibly be right, that attitude, that shutting oneself down from criticism, or immunizing oneself from challenge, is simply fatal to the cause of truth-seeking, the truth-seeking enterprise. It's fatal to an individual person, especially a scholar in his vocation, and it's fatal to institutions like liberal arts colleges and universities. The person who sees his intellectual adversary simply as an enemy to be defeated or destroyed, rather than as a friend joined with him dialectically in the pursuit of the common aim, namely getting at the truth, is already off the rails. He's in grave danger of falling into the ditch of sophistry. So openness to argument, to having one's premises and most fundamental beliefs and values challenged is vitally important to the knowledge-seeking mission that defines liberal arts institutions as the kinds of institutions they are. A spirit of openness to argument and to challenge where it flourishes is what immunizes academic institutions against groupthink and chases the groupthink away when it comes knocking at the door. In that story that Dean Peterson just told us, based on the article in The Atlantic by the student at Stanford, what the student was rightly calling attention to and criticizing was the groupthink that has been allowed to set in, not only at that very eminent and distinguished institution, but at institutions all over the country. Now, part of the problem, of course, is that once groupthink has taken hold, in a community, in an institution, 
folks who are caught up in that group think don't recognize the problem. They're like fish swimming in water. You don't understand or recognize you're swimming in water. After all, when is the last time you ever heard somebody say, yeah, you know what? My problem is that I'm caught up in groupthink. I tend to think just like everybody else around me thinks. That's happened to me in my life exactly once. I, I was for 36 years parliamentarian of the Princeton faculty. And after a faculty meeting once, a very nice colleague of mine, um, uh, someone in what these days is called area studies, um, very eminent scholar herself, came up to me and said, um, Robbie, I just want to say that I really admire you. And I said, oh, well, thank you. Her name was Carol. I said, thank you, Carol. That was, what a nice thing for you to say. And I was puzzled about why she would uh, say it. And she said, you know, um, I really just believe the things I believe because they're what everybody around me believes. But you obviously have beliefs that are different from everybody else around you. And I think that's really admirable. So it, it can happen that somebody can recognize that they're in the groupthink problem, but it's very, very rare. Again, the trouble with groupthink is that when you're in it, you don't know you're in it. You may realize that not everyone shares your views, but you'll suppose that those who dissent from your opinions are irrational or ill-motivated. You'll imagine that anyone who disagrees with you is an ignoramus, a rube, worse, a bigot, a tool of nefarious interests, a fool or a fraud. When someone is in groupthink, that person could pass a lie detector test claiming that he's not in groupthink. But that doesn't mean he's not in groupthink. And wherever ideological orthodoxies settle into place and are not subjected to serious questions and challenges, you have to worry about the groupthink setting in. And that's true whether or not campus illiberalism manifests itself in the more visible ways that we are now seeing so frequently with dissenting speakers being excluded from campuses or being shouted down or being personally, physically assaulted or what have you. Now, it seems to me that viewpoint diversity has its value as a kind of vaccine against groupthink and as an antidote to the groupthink once it begins to set in. Having a diversity of views represented, a diversity of approaches, a diversity of arguments is the cure for campus illiberalism. People who have the spirit of being not too sure that they're right People who want to be challenged because they know that challenging and being challenged are integral and indispensable parts of the process of knowledge seeking. Such people, whatever their own personal views, right, left, center, what have you, will want intellectual diversity on their campuses in order for the institution to prosecute its mission. Now, of course, we all know that it's pretty hard to get this intellectual diversity, especially at mainstream, non-sectarian, state or private colleges and universities, whether it's Berkeley or Princeton. And I think there are a number of reasons for that. While in my own experience it's true, and some of my progressive colleagues and friends tell me that in their experience it's also true, that there is sometimes blatant, conscious, obviously deliberate discrimination against people who dissent from campus orthodoxies when it comes to hiring and promotion. I happen to think that blatant, conscious, deliberate discrimination is not the heart of the problem. It is a problem. It needs to be combated. It needs to be called out whenever it rears its head. But I don't think it's the biggest part of the problem. In fact, I think that conscious, deliberate discrimination is comparatively, I underscore comparatively, rare. I could cite some cases that I personally know about and other colleagues have reported to me, but I believe that the more fundamental challenge is not conscious and deliberate discrimination, but rather something else. And here's what it is. In this veil of tears, we human beings, frail, fallen creatures that we are, have a lot of trouble appreciating meritorious work and even good arguments 
when they run contrary to our own opinions, especially when we are strongly emotionally invested in those opinions and attached to them. As I see it, this isn't a liberal or a progressive or a left-wing problem. It's a human nature problem. Anytime an intellectual or political orthodoxy hardens into place so that it's not allowed to be challenged, it's going to be very difficult for a lot of people to draw the distinction between work I disagree with, despite it's being really very good and challenging and interesting and makes me think, and, on the other side, work that goes contrary to what I just know to be true on issues that are important and critical to me and bound up with my sense of who I am, my identity as a fill-in-the-blank. Progressive, conservative, feminist, libertarian, atheist, socialist, what have you. People will experience in that mentality, when they've adopted that mentality, will experience challenges to the dominant opinions on campus as outrageous attacks on truth, indecent assaults on essential values, threats to what is good and true and right and just, intolerable violation violations of what they sometimes refer to as the norms of our community or our community's commitment to fill in the blank, social justice, anti-racism, what have you. So I ask myself the question, what do we do about this? We've taken the measure of the problem, what do we do? Now, of course, as someone who is in the minority in contemporary academia, I'm not in a great position to do much of anything. I don't have very much power. But I would say to my friends who are on the more progressive side and who perceive the problem as I do, and increasingly, at least old school progressives do see the problem, and who think that something needs to be done about it, I would say to them, well, number one, of course, we need to expose and protect against any conscious discrimination based on viewpoint. And number two, by both precept and example, we need to strongly encourage our colleagues and students to be rigorously self-critical. We need to encourage people to be self-critical in ways that would enable them honestly to say, as I have said in writing about the work of my colleague Peter Singer, the famous or infamous professor of uh, philosophy at Princeton, uh, well, quoting myself here, I'm really scandalized by Professor Singer's defense of the moral permissibility of infanticide. That is what he defends. But there's an argument he makes, and that argument's got to be met. And the burden is on me to make the argument that I do make, that our dignity as human beings comes in virtue of our humanity and not something else. The burden, in other words, is on me to meet the challenge. Now, I want my colleagues on the left side of the political spectrum to take the same position about work by more conservative scholars, especially in hot button areas. But I acknowledge that that's hard to do, and it's especially hard to do when orthodoxies have hardened into place on campus and one is not even hearing arguments against one's own positions. And an enormous percentage of our students today at colleges and universities across the country are in that circumstance. They are simply not hearing. Could not represent to you what people on the other side actually say in defense of their beliefs, whether it's the market economy, the environment, marriage and the family, sexuality, abortion, defense policy, the international order. When one is not hearing other points of view, when one is surrounded by people who simply reinforce one in whatever one happens to believe, true or false, then no matter how much diversity there is on other stuff, race or ethnicity and so forth, we are headed for groupthink. We're on the fast train to groupthink. When one is hearing more or less the same thing from everyone, at least everyone one respects, the motivation to think more critically tends to be very hard to work up. Working it up is so much easier when one is regularly, in the normal course of things, being challenged by thoughtful people, well-informed people, who don't always see things the way one sees them oneself. So it's best, of course, for us not to get into this fix in the first place by permitting ideological orthodoxies to harden. 
But if they have hardened, if they are what the reality is, then we need to help our colleagues to appreciate work and be willing to say that they appreciate work, including when they are engaged in the hiring process or considering people for tenure and promotion that is meritorious even when they do not agree with the arguments for the positions being advanced. Now, on the good news front, a few, not enough, but a few prominent university leaders around the country, the late Robert Zimmer, president of the University of Chicago, was a very notable one, have taken the lead in publicly acknowledging that we have a problem, the echo chamber problem in American academia. The problem of a lack of viewpoint diversity, the problem of ideological orthodoxies, the problem of groupthink. And this is something that we have to acknowledge, not only to be fair to minority viewpoints that do deserve a fair hearing, but to enable our colleges and universities to carry out their fundamental mission as truth-seeking, knowledge-advancing institutions. Now, some of our academic leaders have promoted specific campus initiatives aimed at bringing a wider viewpoint or a wider diversity of views into the discussion, broadening, deepening, and enriching it. And it's not just academic leaders. In some states, state legislators have taken the lead in establishing and funding new initiatives, programs, institutes, especially in the area of civic education, to bring diversity of viewpoint and a deeper exploration of issues to campuses. So you have the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership at Arizona State University, the Civitas Institute at the University of Texas, the Hamilton Center at the University of Florida, uh, the New School of uh, Civic Affairs at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, the Program in American Civics at the University of Tennessee, the uh, upcoming new uh, uh, Salmon P. Chase Center for Civics, Culture, and Society at Ohio State. I commend those initiatives. We should be working together, academic leaders, faculty, trustees, members of boards of regents, univer uh, 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 I'm sorry, state legislators. They should all be working together with the goal of truly diversifying and thereby improving the quality of higher education. Now let me um, give a couple of examples of the value of viewpoint or intellectual diversity from my own experience. One of them is the James Madison program at Princeton, which uh, Dean Pete kindly mentioned, I have the honor to direct. The program was founded 24 years ago and its impact on the intellectual culture of Princeton, precisely by bringing viewpoint diversity into our community, which was badly needed, in a serious way, has been remarkable. It gives me enormous satisfaction that this opinion of mine is shared by many of my liberal or progressive colleagues. They praise the Madison program for turning what might have been campus monologues into true dialogues or multilogues, benefiting everyone in the process. Uh, my own the president of my university, Christopher Eisgruber, has praised the Madison program for precisely this contribution. The presence on our campus of an initiative like the Madison program ensures that there will be people, adults with PhDs <laughs> around who think different things, even about fundamental issues that everybody cares about in which many people assume wrongly all academics are on one side of. And that's great because it means that in general discussions across the university and not just within the Madison program itself, people cannot simply suppose as they used to be able to that everybody in the room shares the same assumptions or holds the same opinions. People know that they will have to defend their premises because they will be challenged. That makes for a different and much better and more serious kind of engagement, a kind of engagement that profoundly enriches the intellectual life of the entire community. One of my earliest memories from Princeton when I arrived back in the Middle Ages in the mid-1980s was at a uh, big campus event uh, with a speaker, a very prominent speaker, turned out you know, literally hundreds of people uh, showed up, which for, which for Princeton is a very big event because we're a small university. And the speaker began his remarks by telling a, a rather crude joke at the expense of Ronald Reagan. And everybody laughed. 
that speaker could assume that he could make that joke and that everybody would laugh because he could assume that everybody agreed with his politics and held Ronald Reagan in contempt. Right then, from that moment, I, I, I recognized we have a problem here. When a speaker comes in, a speaker should not be able to assume that. In a healthy academic community, a speaker should know there are going to be people who will challenge my premises. So I'm going to have to defend them. Now, the second example I want to cite, again, from my own experience, is the experience I've had teaching with my friend and colleague, uh, now presidential candidate, Cornell West. Now, Cornell and I have some very, very fundamental disagreements. He is honorary chairman of the Democratic Socialists of America. I am not honorary chairman of the Democratic Socialists of America. He voted for Jill Stein for president in 2016. And he is, of course, a candidate for president himself in 2024. But Cornell and I, despite our <laughs> deep disagreements about so many political and other issues, have taught together, did teach together uh, while he was a professor at Princeton and even uh, when he came back from being on leave when he was at Harvard uh, for a number of years. Our seminar readings included the writings of Sophocles, Plato, Augustine, Luther, Erasmus, Marx, Mill, Hayek, Newman, Kierkegaard, Solzhenitsyn, Dewey, Du Bois, C.S. Lewis, Leo Strauss, Gabriel Marcel, Martin Luther King. And what happened and happens in our classroom really is magical. And the impact on our students is amazing. What you have here is a genuine collaboration across the lines of deep ideological difference. Cornell and I collaborate across those lines in the common project of truth seeking, knowledge seeking, wisdom seeking, engaging with each other and our students in a serious, respectful, civil manner, striving to understand each other and learn from each other, treating each other not as enemies to be defeated or destroyed, but as partners in the dialectical process of seeking truth, knowledge, and wisdom. We have done this at Pepperdine uh, together. And here's the thing that really matters. It's not just that Cornell, two, you know, two, two guys who like to talk and yak at each other a lot and like each other have to get to have a good time. That's nice, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is this, the students learn and they learn how to learn. They learn to approach intellectual and political matters dialectically, that is with the giving the back and forth of argument, presenting the best reasons on one side, presenting the best reasons on the other side, critically engaging the most compelling points in favor of competing claims. They learn the value and importance of mutual respect and civility. They learn from two guys with some pretty strong opinions, neither of whom is shy about stating them publicly, that the spirit of truth seeking, the spirit of liberty, is a spirit open to the possibility that one could be in error, even in serious error, and therefore one has the opportunity to learn from one's critics. And now let me be more specific because I want you to understand that what Cornell and I do here really is part of the cure for campus illiberalism. And I just wish more people would do it. Now I've always prided myself as a lecturer on being able to represent accurately and sympathetically moral and political views I myself do not share. For example, in my courses, I, I, I teach things like Marx's Communist Manifesto, uh, Antonio Gramsci, the, the Italian communist uh, leader and uh, theoretician from the early 20th century, his um, uh, prison notebooks, uh, the writings of Frankfurt School uh, scholars like uh, Horkheimer and Adorno and uh, uh, Her Herbert Marcuse. And if I'm teaching uh, about those scholars or any other issues, uh, uh, I like to think that someone who came in to hear my lecture not knowing which side I was on wouldn't be able to figure out from my presentation which side I was on. They'd be getting a fair exposition of the theorists' arguments with the best arguments supporting them and the best arguments criticizing them. Because I don't see it as my job to tell my students what to think. Honestly, I don't. My job is not to get them to agree with me. My job is to teach them how to think more deeply, more critically, which always includes self-critically, and for themselves. It's not to get my ideas into their heads. 
Now, that's not because I think that professors should hide their views or anything like that. I mean, obviously, I don't hide my views outside of the classroom on anything. It's just that I don't think that classrooms should be used to proselytize or push a political agenda or recruit students for one's own causes, things that happen all over the country at colleges and universities today. Faculty members even give credit in some cases to students for being involved in activism so long as it's activism on the side the professor agrees with. This is outrageous. There's a place for catechism classes and the like, but that place is not the college or university classroom. The classroom is for exposing students to the best that has been said, for the competing views on any disputed question, so that students can learn to think more carefully, more critically, and above all, for themselves. So as I say, that is always without fail, regardless of how much I care about an issue, what I try to do. But what I've learned from teaching with Cornell is that as good as I always thought I was at that, I'm not good enough. The evidence for that is simply that time after time, in the course of our seminars together, I found Cornell saying something or making a compelling point in response to a point that I had made or that one of the conservative students in the class had made that simply would not have occurred to me had Cornell not made it. A point that was seriously worth engaging and considering. Had Cornell not been there, even doing my best to represent his side, the point would not have been made and the benefit to be conferred on the entire class and grappling with it would not have been gained. And guess what? Cornell tells me that he has had precisely the same experience time and time again. He's found me making points or developing lines of argument that he says he never considered and which simply would not have occurred to him, despite the fact that he shares my aspiration to represent as fully and sympathetically as possible positions and arguments from across the spectrum. Now that, it seems to me, is a very good argument for promoting intellectual diversity. A healthy intellectual milieu really is one in which students and scholars regularly encounter competing views and arguments where intelligent dissent from a dominant view is common and the value of dissent is understood and appreciated. Where beliefs that can be supported by arguments and advanced in a spirit of goodwill are common enough that they do not strike people as reflections of ignorance or bigotry or bad will, and people who do not share them do not experience challenges as personal assaults or as outrages against the community's values. Now, it's great to have competing views among instructors in a classroom, the sort of thing Cornell and I do, but I realize that that is a luxury that most institutions cannot afford, at least on a regular basis. But diversity among faculty on campus, even if it's not in the same classroom, helps to cure campus illiberalism. It voids the tendency of people, students and faculty alike, who hold positions that happen to be dominant, to suppose that the college or university is theirs and is for people like them, not for people who disagree with them, who are treated as outsiders. It sends a message that all who seek knowledge of the truth and wish to pursue the truth in a spirit of civility and mutual respect are welcome here as insiders sharing the truly constitutive values and goals of the community, not outsiders who are at best merely to be tolerated as if they were present in the academic community only on sufferance. So, am I advocating affirmative action for conservatives? Not at all. I'm advocating attitudes and practices that will cure campus illiberalism without the need to give conservative scholars preferences in hiring and promotion. If conscious and especially unconscious prejudice against people who dissent from prevailing orthodoxies were defeated, if intellectual diversity were truly valued for its vital contribution to the cause of learning, the hiring problems would, I believe, take care of themselves. And that would create an environment that was inhospitable to campus illiberalism of any sort, be it of the left or the right. 
Let me now close with a final plea to teachers, administrators, school board members, parents, and anyone else who's in a position to influence what goes on in K-12 and especially high school education. You are sending to those of us who teach at colleges and universities increasingly diverse students, and that's great. It's especially wonderful to see so many young men and women who are of the first generation in their families to go to college. I, I was that myself. And to see so many, many children of immigrants from nations and cultures spanning the entire globe in our classrooms. Bravo. That's wonderful. That's what we want. But I'm also seeing something else and it's not what we want or should want. Students who are diverse in myriad ways, yet alike in their viewpoints and perspectives. Students who have absorbed what I sometimes call the New York Times editorial board view of the world. They think what, evidently, they think they are supposed to think if they are to be regarded as urbane, sophisticated, woke. They seem to have absorbed uncritically progressive ideology and they embrace it zealously, obediently, and alas, dogmatically, as a faith, a kind of religion. Challenging its presuppositions and tenets is regarded not merely as wrong or even heretical, but is in many cases quite literally unthinkable. In other words, they come to us already in groupthink. I suppose that makes the job of any left-wing professor who actually does want to indoctrinate his students easy. They come already pre-indoctrinated. Now this is very bad. It makes it fun for people like me to shock and scandalize the youngsters in the way I suppose it was fun for secular liberal professors of an earlier era to shock and scandalize students from devout evangelical backgrounds by teaching Darwinian evolution or introducing them to the historical critical approach to understanding the Bible. But that's scarcely comforting now, is it? If teachers in schools are doing the indoctrination, they really must stop. And even if they aren't, schools need to teach students to question dominant and prevailing opinions among their peers and in their communities and equip students with the tools of critical thinking and logical reasoning that will enable such questioning to be intellectually fruitful for them. For starters, Kids need to be taught that whatever they and their peers believe and take as what, quote, what all right-thinking, unquote, people believe is actually contested by fellow citizens of theirs who are no less reasonable people of goodwill than they themselves are. My experience with students in recent years tends to support the thesis that many are simply ignorant of this fact. Sure, they know that there are people who don't share the views of the editorial board of the New York Times, or the people on stage at the Academy Awards or what have you, but they're inclined to think that such people must be bigots or ignoramuses, bad people or idiots. And by saying that students need to be taught that there are reasonable people who do not share their outlook, I mean they must be taught by example as well as by precept. Teachers and school uh, officials need to model the intellectual tolerance, open-mindedness, willingness to be challenged, and so forth, that we need to see more of in our students at all levels and in our citizens. Young men and women in, say, New York public or private schools, or in San Francisco or LA or Chicago, should not have to wait for college to encounter libertarian, conservative, or other dissenting authors or guest speakers, or for that matter, teachers. I have a sense that there are many schools in which conservative teachers are as rare, and if they exist at all, as exotic as they are in universities. Whatever the reason for this state of affairs, it is not good. And so we have a problem that may have begun in the universities, surely must have begun in the universities, that's now filtered down into the high schools, and into the middle schools, and I loathe, worried to even check to see what's going on in the elementary schools. But it's got to be turned around, and it's us, up to us as citizens and taxpayers to turn it around. Thank you. So you get the front yep. here, and I'll get the near one. 
Great. Well, we've got about 15 minutes for questions, and you have question cards at your tables. So if you have a question, please uh, write it down, and Melissa will be uh, coming around to collect those. Let me uh, just begin with a question um, that I had by your remarks, and, and thank you, Robbie, just provocative. Um, and, but let me start at, at the level the kids call uh, meta. Yeah. You know, the, the discussion around viewpoint diversity is one that in part is a kind of how we should be engaging with one another. But I wonder your thoughts regarding whether we've lost the why, which is to say the pursuit of truth and whether part of the problem that we're seeing on college campuses with a lack of viewpoint diversity is not just simply a lack of awareness of different points of view, but a, a true lack of agreement as to why are we doing this? What are we supposedly pursuing together, i.e. the truth? Well, uh, let me uh, begin by saying I uh, recently encountered a, a, a student who used that term, that word meta. <laughs> so you're telling the truth about that. The kids <laughs> do say meta. So, so I said, oh, you're, you're studying Greek. <laughs> and he said, no. And I said, well, that's a Greek word. Yeah. And he said, that's a Greek word. I said, yeah. He said, cool. <laughs> uh, Again, back in the Middle Ages when I began my <laughs> academic career in the mid-1980s, um, the norm among academic elites was to question the idea that anything could really be true or false, certainly in the domain of morality. There was mm -hmm. a kind of gentlemanly uh, skepticism about the idea of, uh, of truth, a kind of gentle moral relativism. Um, I thought that was really bad in those days. Mm -hmm. It's intellectually untenable. Mm -hmm. It's self-defeating. Um, if there's no such thing as truth, then the proposition that there's no such thing as truth can't be true, for starters. But I have to admit that now when I look back from our current perspective, where so many students and faculty, so many people in academia seem to have lost their sense of fallibility, the idea that we could be wrong about what the truth is, and to have embraced the idea of truth with a kind of fierce, ferocious, and tyrannical absolutism, so that our problem now is not that people don't believe there's truth. Right. They believe there's truth, but they believe they've got it. Mm -hmm. It can't be questioned. They know it fully and perfectly. And if you're not wrong, you're in error, and error has no rights, and you're to be defeated and destroyed because you're a bad person. Mm -hmm looked at from my current perspective, looked at in, in view of that attitude which has become dominant, I sort of long for the good old days of moral relativism <laughs> when people weren't so darn sure that they were absolutely right about everything and had some sense of intellectual uh, uh, humility. The, the correct understanding is that there is indeed a truth, but we are indeed fallible. Mm -hmm. And while we can, uh, get near it by hard work, by careful reasoning, by marshalling evidence, uh, adducing arguments, thinking, being logically precise. We can, we can deepen our knowledge of truth. We can more fully understand it, more fully grasp it. The truth is we will never know it perfectly or infallibly. And we always have to be open to challenge, even to our most fundamental beliefs. The spirit of truth-seeking really is, to quote that passage from Judge Hand on the spirit of liberty, a spirit of intellectual humility, of not yeah. being so sure you're right that you're willing to shut down a critic. Truth-seeking itself requires that we be willing to entertain a critic, which in turn requires that we recognize the possibility that we might be wrong. We were talking at, over dinner last night, um, and I wanted to take on this uh, point that you're making about the problems related to groupthink. Um, it feels like, and this is where I, I want to test this with you uh, to see what your thoughts are, that there's a particular quality, it feels like to me, of this groupthink, 
that will not stand questioning that's of a scale and scope that we may not have seen before, which is to say that there's a quality of this perceived truth, to your point, this is kind of a new movement, that in and of itself it seems to have qualities that would actually squelch or prevent disagreement because it has rhetorically embedded in it the ability to castigate and label those who would bring that disagreement. Does that make sense? It does, and I think that is the product of the rise of um, a sort of sub-ideology, uh, which I would call identitarianism. Mm -hmm. So if you combine absolutism with identitarianism, mm. and then just add a little fragility mm. into the recipe as a kind of seasoning, you've got exactly what I've got now. That is, a person who is deeply uh, identitarian, and who's fragile, will perceive any criticism of his views or ideas or beliefs or lifestyle as a personal assault on him. He'll lose the capacity to understand the difference between a personal attack and an attack on an argument, an mm -hmm. attack on a person and an attack on an argument. Justice Scalia famously said, and he practiced what he preached, that he didn't attack people. He attacked ideas bad ideas or ideas that he thought were bad ideas. And he was willing to be attacked, not personally, but to have his beliefs attacked. And that was because he had not wrapped his convictions, or um, wrapped his emotions so tightly around his convictions that he had become a dogmatist. Uh, those critics of the late Antonin Scalia who see him as a dogmatist were completely wrong and uh, the testimony that they should have listened to was that of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who argued with Antonin Scalia more than any human being on the face of the earth, and would attest that he was the very opposite of a dogmatist. Mm. Someone who loved the exchange of ideas, the combat of ideas, but was open to uh, criticism. They, they, Judge Gin Justice Ginsburg and Justice Scalia practiced the same sort of um, activity that Cornel West and I uh, practice, challenging and being challenged, but not taking personal offense, not supposing that an attack on our ideas is an attack on our identity. Let's get to some of these really good questions. Uh, this one um, goes to this point around civic virtue, which is understood in many of your remarks, but I think it's worth kind of sussing out a bit. It's one thing to understand uh, or to learn the skills of debate. It's one thing to understand or learn about other viewpoints, but there needs to be, and this came out in your talk, this almost required set of civic virtues around humility and courage. And so the question here is, how do we encourage those civic virtues even as we talk about skills and debate and persuasion and learning other points of view? As I said in my remarks, these have to be taught, and they have to be taught by example as well as by precept. Both are necessary, but if I had to rank them in importance when it comes to influencing young people in the right direction, I would, I would prioritize teaching by example over teaching by precept. You have to preach, you have to use words, that's important. It's, it's a necessary condition of the kind of formation of young people that we need as citizens of this democratic republic. So you need to tell them uh, about the virtues that they need to practice. But even more important, you need to model them. We don't have enough adults in positions of authority uh, or positions of public prominence who really model the virtues that we need to see in our young people, who can be passionate advocates of causes without being dogmatists, who can be who, who demonstrate a willingness to learn, to be challenged, uh, uh, an, an openness to critique, uh, a willingness to listen, not just to politely sit by while somebody else talks, but not actually listen, to engage. Students learn even more by the example of teachers, coaches, parents, pastors, than they coaches, than they do by precept. But they're both important. Mm -hmm. We have to preach and we have to model. Here's a 
seems to be a rather personal question here. How would you direct a student who feels there is no hope for their beliefs and has gone uh, silent in speaking their beliefs in school? I would point to the example of the anti-slavery people uh, in the period um, up to, you know, the antebellum period, the period leading up to eventually the terrible uh, tragedy of the, of the Civil War. Uh, the abolitionists were, people who actually favored the abolition of slavery were a very, very small minority. They had no power, no authority. Um, they were looked down on. They, they paid a heavy price if, if it was known that they uh, were abolitionists, not just in the South, but, uh, but even in, in, in the North. But it was very important, even when they were a tiny minority, that they bear the witness, bore the witness that they, uh, that they bore. Uh, another period that's worth looking at is the period at the roughly 19 teens until uh, the end of the Second World War when eugenics became uh, a, a dogmatic belief among the American and European elite, not just the thugs like the Nazis. The Nazis didn't invent eugenics ideology. They picked it up from the progressives. You don't have to take my word for it. My progressive uh, a colleague at Princeton um, uh, Tim Leonard, uh, Thomas Leonard, he goes by Tim. Tim Leonard has uh, written an entire book on the involvement of progressive uh, thinkers, politicians, jurists, religious leaders, philanthropists in the eugenics movement. They were in the eugenics movement up to their ears. And if you were a critic, if you refused to get aboard that train, you were regarded as a hick or a hillbilly or a fundamentalist. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a relatively small number of people who stood up against eugenics, but thank God that they did. So, you know, things can look pretty bleak. Uh, even if you're convinced that an idea really is true, things can look pretty bleak for that idea because the, the dominant over ideologies seem to be overwhelming it. But historical experience teaches us that even a small number of courageous dissenters can in the end prevail. Interesting question here, we've got time for a couple more. Um, essentially flipping my first question on its head, which is, I, I think could, could provide an interesting uh, response here. Can committed Christian liberal arts institutions really be considered universities or homes for free speech if they necessarily discriminate on the basis of belief? How can Christian colleges pursue the liberal purposes of higher education if they have this commitment to truth? Yes, uh, they can. Uh, I believe in pluralism. I think that there are different kinds of universities that perform very important functions and that we're all better off for having not just one type of university, but universities, but several types of universities. Now that doesn't mean that just anything can be a university. There is a difference between uh, universities and catechism or Sunday school classes. There is a difference between universities and re-education camps, Maoist re-education camps. You just not, you know, there's a limit to what you can do or not do and still qualify as a university. But we can legitimately have state as well as private universities. We can have universities as well as colleges. We can have non-sectarian universities as well as religiously affiliated universities. I think religiously affiliated universities make an enormous contribution to the country and they are just right for many students and for many families. Uh, I, I think students should have the choice whether to go to religiously affiliated or non-sectarian or non uh, universities. And sometimes the, the, the fit will not have to do with whether you happen to be a member of the particular faith uh, mm -hmm. or not. Um, Pepperdine is uh, formally affiliated, as I understand it, with the Churches of Christ. That's right. But it's a flourishing place for Catholics and Jewish students. I've met Jewish students and Catholic students who've just flourished at Pepperdine. It's provided exactly what they needed. Now, when I go around the country, and Pete can be my witness uh, to this, and, and, and Jim Gash can be my witness to this, I speak at a lot of uh, religiously affiliated universities. I'm, I'm a Catholic myself. I'm active in my own faith. And I've been invited to, to, to lecture at Yeshiva in New York, at uh, Wheaton College in Illinois, uh, Baylor Baptist College in Texas, of course, uh, Pepperdine, uh, Zaytuna College, which is a Muslim liberal arts college, of course, many different Catholic colleges, Notre Dame, University of uh, uh, Dallas, Benedictine College, many of which are just providing phenomenal educations for students, whether they happen to be, again, members of the faith or not. 
But what Jim can attest, uh, what Pete can attest to is that my message to these universities is it's important for you to be universities and that means you can't be catechism classes. You can require a statement of faith from your faculty and still be a university. That is the faculty are going to share a particular religious faith. But that's okay only if you also recognize that you must not shield or, or, or immunize your students from the critique of the beliefs of the faith. So there should be speakers welcome on campus, even if not members of the faculty, who don't share the faith or who even challenge the faith or challenge mm -hmm. the moral teachings of the faith. Students should hear the best arguments on competing sides. If you're Pepperdine or if you're Notre Dame or if you're Yeshiva, your philosophy department should expose students to the greatest atheist thinkers in the history of philosophy because they're part of that story and their arguments have to be engaged, critically engaged, but engaged. So if a Pepperdine philosophy graduate or a Notre Dame philosophy graduate or a, uh, a yeshiva philosophy graduate comes out of that program never having read Nietzsche's critique of religion, especially powerful critiques of Judaism and Christianity, hmm. you haven't educated him. Now, is there a risk if you expose a student to Nietzsche that he'll be persuaded and become a Nietzschean and cease being a Christian or cease being an active Jewish person? Yeah, there's a risk. That's a risk we take in order to be a university. You got to be open to the most powerful arguments, even against your most cherished beliefs. So I say let a thousand flowers bloom. Let's have non-sectarian universities like Princeton. Let's have religiously affiliated ones like Pepperdine. Let's have state ones like the University of Florida. Let's have private ones like uh, uh, Stanford, but they've all got to be universities. And that means that all of them have to expose their students in one way or another to competing points of view. Now I should say something else here, mm -hmm. just to get this out on the table. What if a non-sectarian university wants to make as its official doctrine secular progressive ideology, wokeism, social justice, Okay, let's say Yale decided to, as I would put it, come clean and say, you know what, we've got a dogma, we've got a set of doctrines, and we stand for those in the same way that Pepperdine stands for Christianity. And so we have a right to privilege those and give them pride of place hmm. and, uh, you know, hire faculty on the basis of their commitment to the doctrines of our faith. We're going to have a code of faith and they got to sign on to it. I say, fine, do it. But truth in advertising, if you're going to be the Oral Roberts University of woke ideology, then you've got to admit it. Say, yep, we at Yale have decided to be the Oral Roberts of progressivism. <laughs> fine. But don't trade on the illusion that you are genuinely non-sectarian and open to the range of ideas and so forth. You gotta come clean, you gotta tell the truth. Too many of our universities are the Oral Roberts of progressivism. Sorry to pick on Oral Roberts, it's a perfectly fine university. <laughs> but it's clearly committed to its faith and it doesn't right. hide it. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. Please join me in thanking Dr. Robbie George. Thanks so much for uh, joining us here today. Thanks again to our friends at uh, the Reagan Library and Foundation. Uh, Dave and Richard, just great to partner with you on this once again and look forward to future opportunities, host future conversations here at uh, the Reagan Library. And thanks so much. Thank you.